Pity Sunday night is such a special time, and I thank the Lord for that. And thank you, Promise and Emily and all of you who brought the music tonight for making this a very special time. In little country church where I grew up, they, uh, they always called the song right before the sermon the special. Did they, did they do that where you were from? They called it the special. Well, this was special tonight, and we thank you so very much. We're going to be looking again at the book of Micah tonight, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And Micah is one of the minor prophets, and he's not called minor because his message is minor, but literally because uh, the message is short. Uh, there's, there's just a few chapters, and they're relatively short. Uh, the minor prophets were people who loved the Lord God very much, and they also loved their nation very much. And they were speaking on behalf of God to their fellow people in the nation and, and his fellow followers of, of the Lord God, and they had strong, clear things to say. I love to read the prophets. In verse chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up and plead your case before the mountains. That's quite a way to start a message. He's saying, the Lord is saying, Listen, I want you to stand up and answer some questions that I have for you. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, the pastor that I used to be associate to many years ago, told a story about a, a man who had gone to sleep uh, during the service, and the pastor was preaching, and the, preacher, and the preacher said, you know, it seems to me that the way some of you people act, you want to go to hell. Seems like you just want to go to hell the way you act. And I want, I want you to tell you now, any of you who really do just want to go to hell instead of heaven, stand up. Well, this fellow hadn't heard anything while he's sleeping except the stand up statement woke him up. And so he stood up, and he was standing out there in the middle of uh, several hundred people and standing all by himself. He looked around for a while and said, Preacher, I don't know what it is that we're voting on. It looks like me and you are the only ones for it. <laughs> well, the Lord is going to call them to account. He says, listen to what the Lord says. Stand up and plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundation of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. What would you think? If somebody came before you to say, stand up, your own trial tonight, the Lord has a case against you. He wants to ask you some questions and he needs answers from you. Stand up and give this kind of statement. And there are three questions. One is a surprising question. And the other is a very personal question. And the other is a question that has already been answered. Uh, in this text of Scripture, we find probably the most famous quotation in all of the Old Testament. The high water mark of the Old Testament is in this, in this chapter tonight. And the Lord is speaking this very strange, very strong chapter, saying, I want to ask you a question. That first question is a very surprising one. We hear it in verse 3. It says, My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and, Mir and Miriam. He goes on to say, I've been with you all these years. I brought you out of Egypt. I gave you the leadership of Moses and Aaron and Miriam. I've done all these things for you. What have I done that makes you treat me like you do? What have I done to you? Answer me, what have I done to make you ignore me like you do, to not follow me, to not obey me, to not care about me, to use me to your own liking? What have I done? It's a very, very surprising question. And then in verse 6, there's a very personal question. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? This kind of question. When you come to worship God, what do you bring? In Oriental countries, it was always customary to bring a gift. If you ever go to, say, Taiwan or Hong Kong or to Japan or someplace like that, you're, you're sort of expected to bring a suitcase of little gifts to bring to people, and they'll give you little gifts to fill up your suitcase. They're not anything expensive or, or vital like that, but it's just kind of a nice gesture. You hand a gift to whoever you visit. He hands a gift to you or she hands a gift to you, and it's something you exchange. He says, when you come before the Lord to worship him, what are you supposed to bring? What do you do? What do you do to get God's favor? What do you bring? He says, do you, do you come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old, 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Those are strong questions. When you come to worship God Almighty, how do you do it? And he's naming how all the religions around them do it. And they were getting kind of impressed with those religions because uh, their ritual and their way of worshiping seemed kind of boring to the people. But man, those people who worship Moloch, they knew how to worship. I mean, there was dancing. It wasn't just dancing. It was dancing. Uh, they were jumping up and down, and, and they were having a great time, and they did spectacular things. In fact, it wasn't unusual for them to sacrifice a baby to the Lord and to, to see all these things happening to their, to their false god Moloch. They would sacrifice their firstborn. Uh, they had a, a custom that, as far as I can tell, is the first mention in literature of the word cornerstone. But when a people who worship Moloch, when they wanted to build a house and they wanted God to bless their home and bless them with prosperity and bless them with many good things, the custom was they would bring their firstborn child, their firstborn son, and they would offer him as a burnt offering. There was a place in the idol of Moloch to place the babies that were going to be burned to death. And they'd put the ashes in a jar, and those jars would be placed in a cornerstone, in a stone in the corner of the house they were building. And they would be there, and this meant they would have prosperity. But those things, while they were vivid and terrible, you have to admit they were kind of exciting. A lot of exciting things were going around when they worshipped Moloch and when they worshipped the other pagan gods and the pagan gods that they had left back in Egypt. They, they had this different kind of thing. It wasn't like this thing of just singing and praising and honoring God. It was an exciting kind of thing. He said, is this what you do when you come before me? What do you bring before me, 10,000 rivers of oil? A, a thousand rams he said look I already own everything you think you've got title to it's already mine I don't need that I don't want that but he's saying what do you bring to me when you come to worship me the first question is a surprising question what have I done to bother you what have I done to you that you treat me like you do maybe God is asking us that today and then the second question is what do you really do what do you bring before God how do you really please God when you worship him and when you honor him, how does your life please God? And so the third question comes, what does the Lord require of you? In verse 8, he has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. This is what God requires of you, to do justly. You know what that means? He's do the right thing, not just in church, but everywhere you go, everywhere you are, you do the right thing. God's Word is always talking about how we live as people among other people, and we do the right thing. Over in Exodus chapter 23, there's a whole chapter in the Word that talks about the laws of justice and mercy. And this is the kind of the bedrock foundation of what he told these people to do if they're going to live together and do the right thing. Do not spread false reports. Do not help a wicked man by being a malicious witness. Tell the truth. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. Interesting words there. He says, resist the power of the majority. Well, the majority is always a power, isn't it? He says, when you do right, you do right because it's right and not because the most people are doing it. He said, resist the pressure of the majority. That's a great pressure that's always put upon. We need to learn to resist that. And then he said something very strange here. Resist pity to the minority. He said, do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. He's saying, don't, don't give favor to someone just because they're unfortunate and they're poor. Always do the right thing. Always treat everybody exactly the same. Treat them all as though they were the same person. Treat them all in a just way. Always do what is the right thing. Treat everyone the same. And he closes in verse 9 by saying, keep your word and make sure that you, that you do keep your word. And then in Psalm 15, there's a psalm. I took a course in seminary when I was brand new, my first semester there. And one of the first assignments was to memorize about 25 psalms in the book of Psalms and by the end of the semester quote them to the professor. And this is one of those that we learned to memorize, that we had to memorize. 
Lord, who may dwell in your sanctuary? Who may live on your holy hill? Once again, he's saying, Lord, what kind of person do you want around you? What's the kind of person who can dwell close to you and live on your holy hill and be in your sanctuary? He whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous and speaks the truth from his heart and has no slander on his tongue, who does his neighbor no wrong and casts no slur on his fellow man. And then notice this statement in the last of verse 4. Who keeps his oath, who keeps his promise, even when it hurts. In the King James Version it says, he who swears to his own hurt. It means he makes a promise and finds out later, it's really going to cost me something to keep this promise. It's really going to take something away from me. It's going to cost me some money. It's going to cost me some friendship. It's going to cost me some standing or some business or whatever. But it's going to cost me something to keep this promise. And he said, blessed is the man who keeps his word even when it hurts him to do so. The Lord's word is full of this practical kind of advice and the kind of advice it's hard for us to, to keep. But what does the Lord require of us? To do justice and to love mercy. You notice he doesn't say to love justice and do mercy. I don't think we would always love justice. I don't think we would always love swearing to our own hurt or keeping an oath even when it hurts us. I don't think we would love that. Doing the right thing all the time would be is a thing that's hard for you to love. He said, I'm not asking you to love justice. I'm asking you to do justice. I'm asking you to do the right thing whether you like it or not. To do the right thing whether you feel like it or not. To do the right thing, whether it helps you or hurts you, do the right thing. Do justice and love mercy. Don't do mercy to be seen by other people doing good things. Don't do it to get a reputation for yourself to say that this is, this is how good I am and look at me and look what I'm about. He said, no, you, you love it. You have an inclination to do it. Now, already I think we're seeing this is impossible. I mean, how can you on the one hand do justice and love mercy, and you cannot except in the grace of Jesus Christ because it is in Christ that that very thing happened. Jesus Christ did justice. You and I deserve to die for our sins. Somebody said, I want to get what I deserve. I said, I hope I don't get what I deserve, and if I got what I deserve, I'd already be in hell. Jesus Christ died for us. He was doing justice. He was paying for our sins, and yet he loved mercy. And he put that in us. He put in us by his Holy Spirit the, the, the wonderful joy of doing justly and, and loving mercy. The word mercy means compassion. It means compassion. You love it. You're inclined to do it. And then the third thing is you walk humbly with your God. You walk humbly with him. So once again, we're seeing this is something that only Christ can do for us to give us the ability to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our Lord. The word humbly is a word that has its root as the word stoop, to bow. It means to say you're walking in the presence of God and you're bowing in his presence and you, you're, you're stooped in the presence of God. You're not proud. You're, you're not arrogant. You're walking in the way of God. What does it mean to walk with God? The Bible has a lot to say about walk. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Uh, the, the, so much is said about the way we walk. Uh, in the old days of 1600s, when the Bible was first printed in the King James Version, the word converse is a word that meant the way we, the way we walk. I mean, converse tennis shoes are kind of true to their name. They're the, what we walk around in. And when the Bible says, let your way of conversation please God, he was not saying not just the way you talk, but the way you live. And part of that living is to understand that Jesus said, I am the way. And to walk with someone means that you, you go the direction they're going. If you walk with God, you go the direction God is going. If you walk with God, you're in step with God. You want to go where he's going. You're walking and you're stooping before him, you're bowing before God who is, who is the Lord God. I have a friend who told me that one day lately he was walking out of a restaurant and he dropped a dime out of his pocket. And somebody said, oh, you dropped a dime? He said, well, I know it. He said, well, aren't you going to bend and pick it up? He said, no, I don't stoop for anything less than a quarter. He said, I'm getting so old now, it's hard to get down. 
And when I do stoop down, I always look around to see if there's anything else to do while I'm down there. But he said, I, I'm not going to stoop for, for a dime. I'll, I'm not going to stoop for anything less than a quarter. And it's getting where I'm not even going to do it for a quarter. I guess God is asking you, what would you stoop for? Would you stoop for him? Would you walk humbly with him and let him lead you and direct you and guide you? And in this brief little chapter, the Lord is asking a question. Do you love me? Why don't you love me? Why don't you follow me? I brought you out of bondage. I died on the cross to pay for your sins. I've given you life eternal. I give you myself. I've given you my leadership. I've given you my direction. Why don't you walk with me? You know what you have to bring me? Not, not spectacular ways of worship, not great big shows, not like the Moloch people or not like the Baal people, not these great kind of shows. God says, what I really want from you and what this world needs from you is that you do justly and you love mercy and you walk humbly as you walk through this life with the Lord Christ at your side all the time. Well, let's bow in prayer, shall we? Lord, we thank you that you're such a great and wonderful God. We know, Lord, that the only reason you hate sin is because it hurts people and you love people. And we know it's hard for you to forgive sin because sin hurts people and, and you love people. And we know that you've put us here to experience your love and to share your love with others. And I pray you'll help us because we walk daily with you, we're in step with you, we walk the direction you're going. And you are the way for us. And because of that, we can do justly and love mercy and show your companionship and your compassion to people all around us. I pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Now we invite you to come and make that decision that honors Christ to come and join our church. We'd love to have that. You don't have to bring credentials. You don't have to have papers or proof. Just come and tell us that you want to be a part of us. And that's all you need to do. We want you to be a part of us. Perhaps there are those who have never received Christ as Savior, and you need to do that tonight. It's the most important thing you'll ever do. One day it'll be the only thing that really matters. Uh, nowadays, God sends weak little preachers to stand before you to say, will you, will you, but one day you'll stand before God Almighty, and the only question asked will be, did you, did you? I pray you won't miss it. Please don't miss it. Come to Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you've made that profession of faith, you haven't made it public, in doing it public, you may help somebody else make that decision. And what greater thing could you do for anyone than to help them come to know Christ as Savior and Lord? Your, your decision itself is a witness, and I pray you'll exert it tonight. Let's stand, and you come and do God's will.